In 2012, Kendrick Lamar released his first major label album titled Good Kid Mad City. This album had singles on it you may know, like Swimming Pools or Don't Kill My Vibe. And if you don't know the album, you might think that these songs are glorifying drinking, like with Swimming Pools, or like with Backseat Freestyle. I mean, there's a lot happening on that song. But in the context of the album, these songs take on an entirely different meaning. It would be like viewing a scene from Star Wars where Darth Vader's choking somebody out or something, and then being like, man, this James Earl Jones guy's awful. Sort of. All right, so here's what this video is about to be. We're gonna dissect Kendrick's Good Kid Mad City one track at a time. We're gonna get into the lyrics, Kendrick's style, the production, recreate a few songs, and see the narrative of the album unfold. This is one of the most cohesive storytelling albums ever made. It's full of darkness, tragedy, angst, questioning systems, faith, hope, and love. It's also got some incredible beats and rhyming on it that's unmatched. It's like if an HBO series was a hip hop album. So whether you're already a Kendrick fan or if you've never dived into his stuff before, there should be something in this video for you. So kick back, relax, and let's start with the first track on this album, Shireen, AKA Master Splinter's Daughter. The first thing we hear on this album is a cassette tape starting. Then we hear a group of young men saying a prayer. Lord God, I come to you as but it's not just any prayer. This is the prayer for Christians. The prayer to accept Jesus as your personal savior, to save you from eternal damnation. For Christians, this is the prayer that makes you a Christian, and it's a new beginning. You're born again. This is not how most hip hop albums start, but Good Kid Mad City is not most hip hop albums. But coming out of this prayer, this ethereal music fades in. It feels like we're being transported somewhere else. We're going back in time to a different scene. Oh, right. The cover of this album reads Good Kid Mad City, a short film by Kendrick Lamar. Now this is the deluxe edition which has a different cover, but the writing is the same on both. The original cover features two of Kendrick's uncles, his grandfather, and a young Kendrick sitting in the middle. Everyone's eyes are censored except for Kendrick because this story is told through his eyes. This is a story about his life growing up, navigating adolescence and becoming, well, real. That'll make more sense later in the album. In this album cover, there's a bottle of booze and one of his uncles is throwing up a gang sign. This really is the perfect cover for this album because everything in this picture is about to be explored. And then on the deluxe version, the album cover is a picture of a van, specifically Kendrick's mom's van. This is the van, the Dodge Caravan that he's driving in this song down Rosecrans, specifically to go hook up with a girl named Shireen. He's 17 and he's only got one thing on his mind. But right when he pulls up, there's two sketchy looking dudes. This scene is interrupted by a skit of Kendrick's mom calling, who leaves a voicemail wondering where her van is. His dad's also in the background looking for his dominoes. The hip hop skit has a long running history, but often you can just skip them. They break up the album, but they're just fun little detours. But on Good Kid, the skits are crucial to the story. Throughout the album, they fill out the rest of the story. And in the case of the skits with his parents, that's Kendrick's actual mom and dad. So this song sets the stage for what's coming on the rest of the album. Kendrick is 17, he's borrowed his mom's van, he's trying to hook up with Shireen, and then there's two sketchy dudes. At the end of the song, on the voicemail, his dad says his mom is killing his vibe, which leads to the next track, Don't Kill My Vibe. This is one of the biggest hits from the album, and like I said at the beginning, if you don't know the context of this album, you might think of the chorus and think, yeah, don't kill his vibe, but there's a lot more to it than that. On the chorus, Kendrick says, I'm a sinner who's probably gonna sin again. Lord, forgive me, which is connecting back to that salvation prayer from the start. On this song, we see Kendrick is fine being by himself. He doesn't want to be around anybody else. This is the start of the main narrative. He can feel something stirring inside of him, like in the middle of the first verse when he says, I can feel the changes. I could feel a new life, I always knew life can be dangerous. I could say that I like a challenge, and you to me is painless. You don't know what pain is. How can I paint this picture when the colorblind is hanging with you? And then getting into the pre chorus, he says, I can feel the changes. I can feel the new people around me just want to be famous. 
You can see that my shitty family did put me on status. To me, that's amazing. To you, that's a quick check without disrespect. Let me say this. Say this, say this. this album is Kendrick's first major label release, but he'd released multiple mixtapes prior, as well as an independently released album, Section 80. So Kendrick is moving up in the world on this album, and on this story, it's just beginning. He's rapping, getting put on stages. He's grateful for his city's support. Oh, right. His city, of course, being Compton, California. You know, the city known for gang violence, the Bloods, the Crips, and also Dr. Dre. You know, member of the gangster rap group N.W.A., producer who's a key figure in the West Coast G-Funk sound. A Dr. Dre, super producer. Oh, he made the headphones. Ring any bells? Come on. That G-Funk sound is not on this track, though. It was produced by Soundwave, who's worked with Kendrick on all of his projects. This is Tide and Fliver by Boom Clap Bachelors. Speed it up. All of this to say, Kendrick is born and raised in Compton, but there seems to be something in him that's unsettled. He's grateful for his city, but right now he wants to be left alone. I want to take a brief minute and thank BeatConnect for sponsoring this video. BeatConnect is a multiplayer DAW that allows you to make music collaboratively, live with other musicians, and it's completely free. I know what you're thinking. Oh, so like Dropbox? No, you can actually see each other's cursors, drag in and arrange audio and MIDI together and see changes in real time. The dock comes with a large range of stock plugins, all of which you can use in multiplayer. You can even sequence MIDI together in real time, along with recording in MIDI parts with you seeing and hearing what your collaborators are playing live and in the moment. There's a multiplayer drum machine where you can drag in, share, and create drum kits together. Plus, there are great preset kits that come ready to use. This is a huge step forward for collaborative music making, and BeatConnect has a ton more exciting features coming in the future. You can download BeatConnect for free using the link in the description and check out their website for more information. At the end of this song, there's a brief skit where a friend pulls up and has a beat CD and says he should get his freestyles ready. Notably, he calls him K-Dot, which was his original moniker. Remember, we're in the past. That brings us to the next song, Backseat Freestyle. Here we see K-Dot freestyling and rapping about some juvenile things, like... I pray my gig big as the Eiffel Tower so I can f*** the world for 72 hours. There's a lot of other stereotypical stuff in this. Well, stereotypical for what a teenage kid might rap about. The crazy thing is that this song was also released as a single. It's a platinum selling song hitting number 22 on Billboard's rap charts. And if you look at it at face value, he's saying all he wants is money and power. Some people might write him off as a lesser rapper. But there's a lot more at play here. This is a short film, remember. This is art. He's embodying a character, his teenage self, playing out the scene of freestyling in the back of his friend's car. In the third verse, Kendrick changes his voice and it almost feels like we're hearing directly from his adolescent id. You know the primitive part of your brain? My rolling dough with a good grind and I run that hoe with a putain that's a relay race with a bouquet. They say, K, you go marry mine. So Kendrick is taking us into his mind as a teenager all over a hit boy beat that's so good. If you don't know the context, you might think Kendrick is just rapping about stereotypical stuff, but in the context of the album, this HBO show, that's the point, it's part of the story. We get to see more of Kendrick's adolescent life on the next song, The Art of Peer Pressure. All throughout this song, Kendrick is doing stuff he doesn't actually want to do, but writes it off by saying, I'm with the homies right now. This includes drinking and smoking and committing acts of violence. He tells the stories and says he never does this stuff until he's around his friends. Then in the third verse, they rob a house. The song gets interrupted when they think they hear someone in the house and run away, getting pursued by police, but ultimately getting away. The song ends with a skit where Kendrick has hit the wrong blunt, one that was laced with angel dust. This really happened to him, which is why he doesn't smoke, and this is one of the things that MAD stands for. My angels on angel dust. And then we get to the next song, Money Trees. This song acts sort of like a summary of everything that's happened so far. You can go right, you can go left. Which life are you gonna choose? The famous line in this song is Everybody go respect the shooter, but the one in front of the gun lives forever. This is an interesting observation. I mean, we might think of the person acting out in violence as the one in control. 
but the one receiving the violence is the one who gets remembered forever. The hook of this song explores what money can do. It can destroy your life. It can destroy relationships, make you do crazy things, but it could also make you rich. This feels like adolescent Kendrick seeing all the bad things that can happen from just chasing money, but he's still holding on to that dream of, I don't know, essentially winning the lottery. This song is full of this tension, but if you take it at face value, you might think it's just celebrating money and greed, when in fact it's questioning the whole thing. So far on this album, we see Kendrick trying to get with Shireen, committing acts of violence, robbing a house, dreaming about money, but all the while questioning the whole thing. At the end of this song, Kendrick's mom calls again, wanting him to bring the van back. But Kendrick's adventures continue in the next track, Poetic Justice. This song features Drake on a verse. It's sort of romantic feeling. He's wanting to get back with Shireen again. He doesn't know a whole lot about her, but he wants to be with her. Now, the term poetic justice has multiple meanings here. For one, it's when someone gets what they deserve. Like at the end of this song, there's a skit where the two dudes from the first track start questioning Kendrick and where he's from. Remember, he was on his way to her house when these two guys popped up. Now they're asking where his grandma stays and being hostile. Kendrick is not in his own neighborhood. He was blinded by his lust for Shireen and has put himself in a bad situation as a result. The other meaning is the movie Poetic Justice, starring two notable people, Tupac Shakur, a hero of Kendrick's, and Janet Jackson, who's sampled on this song. So here's the original. We'll speed it up. On the next song, Good Kid, we're entering the middle of the album, and the action in the story is continuing to rise. The first verse talks about the gang culture of Compton, talking about the colors red and blue as Bloods and Crips. The second verse talks about these colors as well, but this time in the context of police lights, talking about police brutality. Both the police and the gangs are stepping on his neck. They're both doing the same thing to him. The third verse references grown-up candy or drugs and questions if we can live in a sane society. We see in this song that Kendrick is a good kid deep down. He's just caught in the middle of a mad city. Oh, right, that's the other meaning of mad. My angry adolescence divided. Kendrick is torn between being a good kid, doing the right thing, and falling into the drugs, violence, and sex that his city is thrusting upon him. The song is produced by Pharrell, who also sings the hook. Mass hallucination, baby. Ill education, baby. Wanna reconnect with your elation. This is your station, baby. Then on the next track, we descend into a nightmare and see how mad this city really is. The hook of this song calls back to the skit at the end of Poetic Justice, where you from, where your grandma stay. Through the first verse, Kendrick describes the violent gang culture of Compton, including a shooting that he witnessed as a kid. Kendrick's vocal delivery sounds like he's scared, but halfway through the beat changes. Then we hear MC8 say, Wake your puppy ass up. It ain't nothing but a cop that died. Real simple and plain. You teach some lessons about the street. He then delivers a verse all about how he stayed in Compton and what it's really like. There's a storytelling structure called the hero's journey, and one element of it is that the protagonist meets an older, wise teacher. This album doesn't follow the hero's journey arc exactly, but considering that MC8 is a Compton legend, it feels like he's playing an inverse version of this archetypal character. He's the older, wise teacher who stayed in all the stuff that's trying to pull Kendrick down. In Kendrick's last verse, his delivery is frantic and his voice is constantly warping up and down. It's as if he's seeing into possible futures and what he could become. With dreams of being a lawyer, a doctor, instead of a boy with a chopper, they hold the codes like hostage, kill them all if they gossip, the children of the corn, they vandalize and the option of living a lie, drive their body with toxins, constantly drinking and drive, hit the powder, then watch this flame that arrive in his eye, this account with the concept is aiming, they bang in the slide, out that bitch with deposit the price on his head, the tides probably go to the projects, ah. Then, as Kendrick says, he's in the belly of the rough, Compton, USA, we get a very Compton-sounding beat. The next song, Swimming Pools, is another case of a song that could be taken the wrong way if you don't understand the context. The challenge with doing a big concept album like this is it's all one continuous story, and that may make it difficult to have singles for the radio. But this song was a huge hit for Kendrick. 
It feels like a club anthem all about drinking. It's courtesy of production by T minus, but it's not like shots by Lil Jon or something. It's actually the opposite. As Kendrick himself noted in a genius annotation, this song is about me reminiscing about my years, a kid witnessing a housing that indulged adults in alcohol. So much alcohol that it could fill a swimming pool. Eventually, that me reminiscing became a reality when I became an adult. The second verse introduces a new character, Kendrick's conscience. It's still Kendrick rapping, but he's using a different voice, a device that he loves to do. Okay, now open your mind up and listen to me, Kendrick. I'm in your conscience. If you do not hear me, then you will be history, Kendrick. I know that you're not just right now, and I'm hoping to lead you to victory, Kendrick. At the end of this song, there's a skit. Kendrick's been beaten up by the two dudes from the beginning over Shireen. He's back with his friends, and they decide to fire off a few warning shots at the other guys, but one of their friends, Dave, gets shot and killed. Again, the skits on this album are absolutely crucial. Then we get to Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst. This is really two songs in one, but the first beat is one of my favorite beats from this album. It's a combination of a drum sample from Use Me by Bill Withers and a bunch of chops from Maybe Tomorrow by Grant Green. So here's that Grant Green sample. We're gonna speed this up a little bit. There's a lot of individual chops. And then with those Use Me drums. Come on. The lyrics are from the perspective of multiple characters. For one, there's Dave's brother who just lost him. And at the end of his verse, there's gunshots and he's presumably also gunned down. The second verse is from the perspective of a woman, Keisha's sister from Section 80, Kendrick's previous album. She's insisting that she's not lost in the system, but she tells a very sad, difficult story. She says that she'll never fade away, but that's exactly what happens at the end of her verse. The hook of this song says, promise that you will sing about me. They just want to be remembered. They want their life to matter. They're caught up in a lot of stuff in a mad city that's putting so much on them. But just like anybody, they don't want to be forgotten. There's a skit in the middle where his friends want to go get revenge on the guys who shot Dave, but the second half of the song sees Kendrick reflect on his life and how he's tired of running. He's dying of thirst. It's just the cyclical nature of violence. It will never stop. This part of the album, that beat is so good, and paired with Kendrick's lyrics, it's powerful. His solution to dying of thirst is to hop in the water and pray that it works, the water being the holy water of baptism. But even Kendrick seems to be skeptical, he's praying that it works. And at the very end, there's another skit. This is the most powerful moment of this album. A neighbor runs into Kendrick and his friends and ends up leading them in a prayer. The prayer. The salvation prayer. You know, accepting Jesus into your life prayer. The one that started the album. This neighbor character, by the way, is voiced by Maya Angelou. And look, you may not subscribe to Jesus or Christianity, but put that on hold for a second. Just from a storytelling perspective, this is incredible. It's the climax of this entire story. A good kid caught up in a mad city full of gang violence, police brutality, drugs, sex, alcohol, everything we've just witnessed. And rather than go get revenge, Kendrick and his friends decide to break the cycle of violence, ask for forgiveness for the things they've done, and start living a better life. That's incredible. As Kendrick has said, this album is about moving from a negative situation into a positive one, into a real one, which is the name of the next song. This song is a reflection on what makes someone a real one. Kendrick's delivery is calmer and more controlled as he raps. It could be him talking to himself or talking to someone younger than him. He stresses the importance of loving yourself and how you can't truly love something or someone else if it's not first coming from a place of loving yourself and being happy with who you are. He concludes by saying that none of the stuff he's been after, money, power, street cred, none of that makes him real. Then we learn what does make you real by way of another voicemail from his father. Any you can kill a man, that don't make you a real Real is responsibility. Real is taking care of your mother's family. His mom gets on the message and says that Top Dog is called. That's the record label that he's on, starting with Section 80 before this album. She says he should come back and tell his story to the kids of Compton and let them know he was just like them, but moved from a dark place of violence to a positive one. He should do it for his city. 
which of course is exactly what this album has done. Kendrick doesn't hate Compton, that's where he's from. As mad of a place as it is, he has love for it, and especially the people in it. Then we hear the sound of a cassette tape stopping and rewinding. That's the end of the story that started all the way back on the first track. But there's one more song to go. Compton. Again, this album and story don't follow the hero's journey arc perfectly, but this feels like another element from it. The hero returns home, but everything is different now. As the song says, ain't no city quite like mine. Kendrick is choosing to embrace and love his city, even with all of its flaws. He's no longer pulled down by the negativity. He's able to rise above it, but still not judge or abandon his city and the people. This song features Dr. Dre and the whole thing feels like a victory lap. The main story is over and now it's time to celebrate this mad city and give it some love. This song was produced by Just Blaze and it's definitely the most celebratory sounding beat on the album. The album concludes with one final brief skit, Kendrick borrowing his mom's van, saying he's gonna be back in 15 minutes. This could be taken a couple ways. It could be the moment right before the beginning of the album, literally Kendrick grabbing the van and going to Shireen's, but because it's placed at the end of the album, it feels like this could be somebody else. Anybody else. Another good kid in this mad city who's about to go through a lot and hopefully make it back to a positive place. If that's the case, I hope that good kid listens to this album and can find comfort in Kendrick's story. Look, I've been talking about this album for a long time now, but it is not a replacement for listening to it. This is art, capital A art. Capital A, capital R, capital T art. Maybe two T's. Go give this album a listen, whether it's the first time, whether it's your 50th time, go listen to it. It's just incredible. It's moving, it's disturbing, it's dramatic. It's got incredible beats, incredible rhymes. It flows like a movie. It's real. When this album first came out, many people compared it to Nas's Illmatic. It's Kendrick's major label debut, features a lot of different producers, and has powerful storytelling about a kid's experience growing up in a world of violence, just like Illmatic. That's high praise, because Illmatic is one of the best hip-hop albums of all time. I mean, just take the song New York State of Mind. Nas takes two big classic New York ideas and flips them on their head. Or should I say he monkey flips them with the funky rhythm. Sorry, I'm out of time. For that story and that song, click here.